Hello, I'm Joe Davich, Executive Director of the Georgia Center for the Book, an affiliate of the National Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. There are affiliate centers for the book in every state and many U.S. territories. We all help carry out the mission of the National Center for the Book, which is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy nationwide. We also promote our state's literary heritage by focusing on books and authors with a connection to our states and territories. Every year as part of our participation in the Library of Congress National Book Festival, each affiliate chooses books with a local connection to be part of the roadmap to reading. These great reads from great places are a collection of books for adult and young readers selected by affiliate centers for the book to celebrate our literary landscape and heritage. Books may be written by authors from the state, take place in the state, or celebrate the state's culture and history. You can learn more about this program and the other centers for the book at read.gov. Today, we are speaking with great read authors from Region 2 East, which includes states and territories from the Allegheny Plateau and misty Blue Ridge Mountains to the azure blue waters of the Caribbean Sea. Our speakers were invited by affiliate centers for the book from Florida, Georgia, Maryland, North Carolina, Puerto Rico, South Carolina, Virginia, the U.S. Virgin Islands, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Thank you all so very much for watching our video, and we hope that you enjoy the discussion. I came to Florida in 1977 to teach at the University of South Florida, Tampa. And I'm probably the least likely person to be discussing writing books about Florida. Uh, I knew nothing about Florida. I did not even know in 1977 whether Tampa was on the East Coast or West Coast, but it was a job. And it was in Rome, Italy, ironically, that I became infatuated with Italy or with uh, Florida, the Sunshine State. I was hopelessly homesick for my family. And every week I would go to the American Embassy Library in Rome and I would read what was going on in Florida then. And 1980, 81 is one of those seismic years in Florida history. The Mariel Boatlift, the Miami race riots. Every day, a thousand new acres uh, developed to become shopping malls, et cetera. And I vowed when I came back, I would shift my focus to trying to figure out this state that was the fastest growing state in America in uh, the 1980s. And uh, think about this, in 1880, Florida was the smallest state in the American South. On the eve of World War II, Florida was still the smallest state in the, in the, in the South. Today, we, we passed New York in 2014. We're the third largest state in America uh, uh, on the eve of 23 million people now. And that's not including 164 million tourists. So any state that any state growing that fast with such an interesting cast of characters is a dream for a historian to try to capture. Um, so my book um, is called The White Mosque, and it is based on a research trip that I took in 2016 to Uzbekistan to research um, an event that I found fascinating, which was a migration of Mennonites from what was then Southern Russia, what's now Ukraine, to Central Asia, to what's now Uzbekistan in the 1880s. 
And I'm Mennonite myself. I had a Mennonite education. I went to a Mennonite high school. I went to a Mennonite college and I had never heard of this story. And so when I came across it, I was just fascinated. Like what were these Mennonites doing in Central Asia? And what they were doing was following a very charismatic preacher who told them that Christ would return to meet them in Central Asia on March 8th, 1889. He had worked this out to a date. And so they went, they followed him. It was a very um, grueling two-year journey. Um, and of course, you know, spoiler alert, uh, Christ didn't come back. And so it was a huge disappointment to this community. Um, but what I find most interesting is what happens after the disappointment because this group did not leave. They stayed there and there was a Mennonite village in a Muslim Khanate in Central Asia for 50 years. And what really gripped me about this story was the way that it connects to my own story because my family is Mennonite on one side and Muslim on the other. So this early moment of Mennonite Muslim interaction was just fascinating to me and it turned into a large project, seven years of research, um, much of it done actually in Virginia because we have a large um, Mennonite community here in the Shenandoah Valley where I live and um, Eastern Mennonite University is located here. And, um, and that's where I did some of this research. So it's a story that spans and that, that kind of moves globally and is both very distant from me in time and space and also very close. Sympathy in Florida. Uh, hands raised, please. How many uh, Americans are sympathetic with Florida? Florida is a touchstone to America today. If you think about it, every issue that matters, Florida seems to be part of the national conversation. Is it immigration? Immigration, a governor now, uh, Governor DeSantis, ironically, his grandchildren or his uh, grandparents were Sicilian immigrants as were mine, but it's been very tough on, on immigration. Uh, the environment, is there a state in a more perilous setting than Florida in 2023? I, I interesting in, uh, in doing a lot of book talks on this, I will ask audiences a, a really tough question. Are you, how many of you are confident about the future of Florida? And I am stunned at, how negative many Floridians are about the state, particularly when it comes to the climate crisis. Um, last year, Florida had several killer hurricanes, which illustrated how perilously close to the sea we are. In Florida, a one foot rise in sea level can be uh, catastrophic. Um, in terms of growth, I, I discussed the meteoric rise of Florida, but Florida is having a very difficult time handling growth. That seems to be a touchstone issue in so many places, in part now because the insurance companies are fleeing Florida because Florida uh, is so close to environmental catastrophe. So I'd like to tell stories. As a, I think historians are the best storytellers out there, but they should be stories with a purpose. And uh, uh, my, my book includes a lot. Let me, let me read one passage from the book that I think is beautifully uh, illustrates this point. So in 2004, Florida was hit by four hurricanes in six weeks. And one of the hurricanes hit the Everglades. And let me, it's a short paragraph. It begins, few brides plan a wedding during a hurricane. Nowhere in Rochelle Lee's guest list was a wedding crasher named Jean, crypto reporter. The teacher's wedding reception was to be held in the most beautiful building in Henry County, the Clewiston Inn. Built in 1918 for the US Sugar Company, 
this august structure had begun to decline, but in September 2004, it still whispered elegance. Ms. Lee had prepared for this special moment for months, crafting hundreds of jar jars of guava jelly for the guest. A glades, a glades dune buggy awaited the new bride and groom as did Hurricane Jean. And she ended the story saying, basically we partied all night. Beaming, she said, we're pretty tough out here, we survive. Hurricanes teach lessons of humility and community. So to the outsiders out there, Florida is really a special place. Uh, it may seem crass and raw and unregulated, but there's a touching sense of community in the state as well. Um, so when I think about all of the different um, elements that are raised by this question, so there's the contemporary, there's history, there's storytelling, um, there's empathy. I think, you know, there's, there's a connection between those things, which is sort of the act of connecting itself. I mean, the contemporary doesn't mean anything without history. It doesn't have any meaning. There is no contemporary without history. So I think in order to talk about the contemporary, to understand where you are, um, you have to look at where you come from and try to imagine where you're going as well. And in the same way, you know, um, storytelling is a way of organizing information. And it's actually the most powerful way of organizing information that humans have, because it allows us to actually comprehend the information. I think it's it's more important than ever. The more we're surrounded by kind of a sea of information, we need that connectivity. We need to be able to put it together and fashion it into a story. Um, and that's I think that's that's the effort um, that that you make, especially when you are bringing history and memoir together, um, as my book does. It's this question of you know, there's a larger history that's happening. And there's also my own small part in that. What's the connection between those things? Um, and it's, you know, it's something that is important to do for yourself to understand your own story in relationship to history. Um, but it's also something that I think is really wonderful to share with others, to try to allow other people to then connect themselves um, to that history and to your personal experience and to you. And that's, you know, that's sort of, that's a lot of, of, the, of the role of empathy. My favorite book of all times, and my students generally hate the book, is Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, The Yearling. I, I weep when I read the book. She is such a beautiful writer. Book was published in 1938. First book by a Floridian about Florida to win the Pulitzer Prize. It's a, it's a simple story about a young boy, Jody, and his pet deer, who is a yearling. And basically both evolve from youth to yearling and uh, as you probably know, uh, Jody's mother forces him to kill the deer because he's eaten their crops. He runs away. The final scene may be the most tear-jerking scene in history. You can also see the movie. Gregory Peck pays, plays the role of Paul Baxter. But it's a beautiful movie. The, the Florida countryside, that area uh, in central Florida where it was filmed. Um, I love Marjorie Kenan Rawlings the yearling. My heart aches when I talk about it. I agree. The yearling is a great book. Mm -hmm. I haven't read it for a really long time, but I did love it. Um, so my favorite book is, um, is a book, a very long novel called In Search of Lost Time by a French writer named Marcel Proust. Um, and it's a, it's a novel in which he deeply minds his own life. So he is really um, putting a lot of his own story, his family, people that he knew into this immensely long, very beautiful um, life narrative. And um, 
And I love that. I love that he um, that he draws on his life, but that he also fictionalizes it and kind of um, makes this life glitter with so much meaning and so much beauty that is accessible to people other than himself. In other words, it ceases to be just his story. It becomes a part of literature and it becomes it becomes something that that other people, people like me, you know, a hundred years later, um, I was born a hundred years after him, um, and I still love to read this book. Um, and in terms of the question of um, telling your own story, since writing a memoir, I tend to get asked this question by a lot of people. A lot of people are interested in writing memoir, and and often they're asking the question like kind of who am I? Like, who am I to write a book? Who am I to write a memoir? Like, my life is so ordinary, or, you know, who would want to read about my life? And my response to that is that if you have a life, you have a life story. If you are alive, and you have lived, then you have a story to tell. And often, you know, the tricky part is just figuring out what is it about that story? What are the connecting points where other people can kind of be invited and welcomed into that story and tap into it. Um, but that's just a question of, that's a question of form. That's a question of figuring out how to do it. But the story is already there. You already have it. Thanks so much, Joe. I'm so happy to be here. So The Kudzu Queen is about Maddie Lee Watson, um, a girl from Eastern North Carolina, 15 year old who wants to be the kudzu queen. She wants to win a beauty competition and she wants the kudzu king who's twice her age to fall madly in love with her. I grew up thinking of kudzu as that thing that made tunnels out of highways um, and took over fields and tractors and trees. Uh, and the number of years ago I was in the library and I happened to come across an article on microfiche. Don't ask me why I was on microfiche or came across something about kudzu, but I found an article about men who made it their life's work to promote kudzu across the south and had kudzu festivals and all sorts of kudzu competitions and kudzu beauty pageants. So of course I had to write a book to find out why this could possibly be true. So I wrote um, The Blue Line Down. Um, I wrote it while I was still in college. It was my senior project. Um, and uh, the book is about a group of union busters called the Baldwin Felts. They were a real group. Um, they operated in the late 19th century, early 20th century. I learned about them in my Appalachian literature course and just had a hard time finding them anywhere else in fiction or nonfiction. Um, so I thought, well, there's my idea for a niche to, to write about. So this story follows a young man who is a Baldwin Feltz um, agent. And when, um, his, when his ethics are tickled <laughs> and he starts to question whether he should be doing what he's doing, um, when he tries to leave, it triggers a uh, multi-state manhunt that ends him up in South Carolina with bootleggers. So um, it's, it's a, a big adventure and a little, little book. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm really happy to be here and thank you for doing this. Uh, my book is called Strange As This Weather Has Been. It's about mountaintop removal strip mining in Southern West Virginia. Uh, the book follows a family who lives near one of these mines, under one of these mines. They're uh, very uh, protected, so it's hard for the family to find out what's really happening to, to them and to their land and what kind of danger they're in. So the novel uh, follows 
this family and others, it's based on interviews that I did, my sister and I did when uh, my sister was making a film about mountaintop removal, a documentary. And in the course of listening to people in the interviews, uh, I started hearing the stories of kids in my head, kids telling stories about living in this situation. So I started to write those down, uh, hoping they were short stories because I'd never written a novel before. And then I realized that the uh, subject matter was too, too, too deep and too broad for a short story. So eventually I, read, I wrote the entire novel. So I think as a species, we have a tendency to think that we are smarter and more progressive than anybody who came before us in history and that we're the only ones who ever thought about these ideas that we're trying to deal with as a culture. Um, and it's just not true. If, if you look back, you see a lot of um, kind of ebbs and flows of how people deal with stereotypes and race and gender and all sorts of things. And so um, when I write a book, it's really important to me not to tell people what to think, but to make them think. And so what I tried to do was to write about characters who were struggling with all of these things, to struggling with how you define um, what it is to be a, a girl growing into a woman, um, how you define um, for interracial friendships, um, what what they look like individually, so that people could think about things um, where we're dealing with a lot of conflict now, and we've always dealt with a lot of conflict. And what I wanted was a book that would spark conversation. Somebody once told me, you know the score, but you don't keep it. And so I wanted to create something that didn't hold back but didn't dictate either. Uh, I got one element I brought into the Blue Line Down was um, thinking about how to maybe add in a cultural narrative into a story that's set in the past um, is an element of um, something called target child selection, uh, or sometimes it's called the Cinderella phenomenon, where um, early in the book, this is in the, the prologue, um, you see a depiction of a parent abusing one child, but not the other. And this is a, it's a phenomenon that occurs quite a lot. We think of abuse as if a parent is abusive to one child, they're abusive to all the children. And that does not always occur. And it, it creates a unique dynamic uh, in a household when um, sometimes other children don't know, hey, you know, my brother was abused growing up, but when I wasn't, I was given affection. Or vice versa, when you were the victim and your siblings were not. Um, and that's something that I wove into the narrative, some of these characters we're dealing with, but you know, as, as I was working through the story, I kind of um, started drawing parallels between that, that phenomenon in family unit and then like a cultural unit, you know, how Appalachia really deals with a lot of um, prejudice <laughs> in the, within the nation and um, even within their own communities. Um, and so that's something that I tried to explore in the book to, to add some complexity and also to raise hopefully awareness that you know, these things these things happen and to um, you know, be watchful for them. I think the angle that I'll take with this is talk about fiction versus nonfiction, because when I was writing this book, uh, the most common question I got was, why aren't you writing a nonfiction book, which is what I thought I would probably do when I was first interested in the subject. But um, through the course of, of writing this book, and then uh, it's, a, it's not a new book. I mean, the book came out in 2007, so I've had a lot of audience reaction to it. Um, I think that if I had done a nonfiction book, the, the, the advantages that fiction gave me in terms of history, literature, and empathy um, is that I was able to build full interior worlds of six different characters because it's narrated from six different people who have different perspectives or attitudes on the subject of mountaintop removal coal mining. And so I guess where I'm going with this is towards the, uh, the way that this can build empathy uh, for different kinds of attitudes towards environmental destruction or environmental conservation, uh, but importantly, immerse the reader 
for pages and pages. It's really like a lot of hours, right, in these people's lives so that they can, instead of reading this abstractly as in a magazine or newspaper about what's happening to people in Appalachia, uh, they have the opportunity to, to live that experience of what's happening to these people in Appalachia. And, the, and four of the narrators are children, which I think is also an effective way to build empathy, because even if uh, adult readers maybe were felt alienated from some of the adult characters, I think there's enough that everyone sh shares as a child that they could that they could uh, inhabit or sympathize with with these children that again helped um, build empathy and also and I think uh, Maris, I think you were I forget who was saying this. I wonder if you were saying this, but uh, <clears throat> the use of the children also helped me just show the subject instead of having an agenda and preaching about the subject. So I figured that if through fiction. Uh, readers could experience what 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 was going on. They would then make make up their own minds about uh, their political attitudes towards towards the Mount Top removal strip mining and situation in Appalachia. So I hear voices. I think a lot of novelists hear voices um, and I can't start writing until I've got the narrative voice. Um, and once the narrative voice starts speaking, I start running around as fast as I can writing down everything they say. I am a ridiculous overwriter. The first draft of this novel of the Kudzu Queen that I thought was complete, beautiful, perfect was 680 pages. And even my mother would not have read that even as much as she loves me. So. Um, I took a book out of this book. It's now 320 pages. But what I did was I just kept playing pickup sticks. Can I pull this phrase out, this character, this sentence, this chapter, this subplot, until I had only what I thought the book needed. And I teach, and for me, teaching and writing take the same kind of energy and the same kind of attention. So what I have to do is give myself what I call writing weeks, where I park the car around the corner and I turn off the phone and turn off the computer except to write on it. And then I do nothing but write. And when I'm doing that, I write 10 pages a day and just pile up those pages so that I can pair them down for the next novel. So the Blue Line Down um, came to be as a school assignment. <laughs> um, and, you know, that was... I respond a lot to to structure and I guess to expectations in that in that sense. But um, you know, since I've been out of college for many years now, I've kind of had to simulate that in some ways. Is when I think about what kind of story I want to write, you know, it's it's got to be more than just oh, this would be a cool story. Is what I really want to say is this worth saying? Um, as far as routines, I, you know, I've got a almost two year old and another baby coming in five weeks. So <laughs> routine is, it comes and goes, <laughs> I'll just say that, which I guess makes it not a routine anymore. But, um, you know, I, yeah, I, I do find that structure is, um, is really important for me to, to set aside time to have detailed outlines. My outlines are very long um, because if I'm in a stuck place, I like to look at that outline and say, okay, I just follow the blueprint, you know, just keep going. So um, that's what it looks like for me in this stage of life. I, I, I write, uh, Mimi and Maris have, have brought up several different ways that are important to my process. Um, I do hear voices. And as uh, Maris said, it also, I need to feel kind of pressure. I can't decide. I can't say, oh, I want to write a want to write a story and then write the story. It's got there's got to be an urgency behind it. Uh, I hear voices. Sometimes I just hear sounds, um, and those all come in fragments. So I spend a lot of time just writing down a whole ton of fragments, um, which is very inefficient. I mean, for this book I'm writing now, I spent all of 2020 writing down a lot of different passages, and now the big project is how do they go together, but if I use my intellect too early, it shuts down the voice, and it shuts down its discovery, so I have to keep that out, and I can't, I can't organize it without the intellect, so um, I, like Mimi, I, I teach, so I too have to, uh, I don't, I don't set a whole week aside, but I get up in the morning and do it straight away because if then I have to go teach or grade, or grade papers, that's such a different operation of the brain that it messes up my process. I can't do it. So, so my structure is uh, get up early in the morning and do it before I start the uh, paid work. So.
So I think of people as being like trees. And we have all of these rings inside of us of all the ages that we've been. And my 15 year old ring is really wide from when I was a 15 year old girl. And so I think that affected a lot of my reading and a lot of my writing. I love the stories of Alice Monroe, the short stories of Alice Monroe. And I think she manages to capture the complexities of that age um, and the frustrations of that age and the brilliance of that age better than almost anybody I've ever read, especially in a, something like Miles City, Montana, when she looks back on childhood and then sort of superimposes it on her adulthood or a character's adulthood. So um, I also, I teach writing, not just in the schools and not just to teachers, but I teach it through something called Rideaways, where we go to a chateau in France and a villa in Italy and a Adobe in New Mexico and a manor house in Ireland. And we spend a week writing and workshopping and really digging in. And I think, I absolutely believe that everybody has a story. I mean, I've been teaching writing for many, many years. And I also believe everybody's a writer. And I think people get told that they're not writers. Uh, sometimes I find people who say I can't write because some teacher told them they had bad handwriting and they think, well, that means I can't write. So to me, the joy of being a teacher is the joy of saying, what do you love? What do you care about? What scares you? What frustrates you? What matters to you? And how do we turn that into words that when you look back, you'll go, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. And how do you you take those words and revise them so you can hand them to somebody else and they can go, wow, I've always felt that way, but I never knew how to say it. So my goal as a teacher is to bring out the writer in everyone. And my goal as a writer is to give people books to get lost in. Um, yeah, there are countless books that are important to me, but when, when you ask you know, what are stories that are important to, to you? I, I really just think of my family stories. I mean, there's there's tremendous oral tradition in Appalachia and it's something that I just took for granted growing up. I thought everybody, <laughs> um, you know, when they go see family are, I guess, and they listen to elaborate retellings of stories um, for hours and hours. I mean, all families have stories, but um, my uncle would reenact. I mean, it was like a theatrical element to it. You know, if they're retelling a story that was set in a car, they're going to line up the chairs like a car. You know, mama was in the front seat, daddy was in the you know, in the passenger, and we're all this. We were sitting here, you know, you were sitting there. <laughs> you know, it's this elaborate production of retelling stories, and um, there's an entertainment value to it, but there's also, I think, a family legacy um, where it's a way of preserving, you know, the generations before you. I mean, if you think about, you know, the generation before your grandparents, what do you know about them? For most people, it's very little. They never probably met those folks. Um, and yet without them, you wouldn't be here. The way that they parented, the way that they um, had their marriage, you know, conducted their marriage, their religion, their way they cooked, all that informs who you are right now. Um, and so I think that's why those stories are important, but, um, yeah, I just, that that oral tradition <laughs> and those stories, it's it's something that um, really is, is a living thing. Uh, I totally agree with Maris. I mean, I, I think um, being from Appalachia, being from the South as well, the, the, the natural facility we have with storytelling, because we've heard it our whole lives, it now everybody in the United States has it. I lived in Seattle for a long time. They cannot tell a story. You know, they talk abstractly. They don't know how to build it. Um, they don't know what, how to reveal, you know, at, at, a, at a proper place. And um, and I think it's in, in terms of other people telling their stories, I think what I, I'm going to what I would advocate for is that more of people telling stories to each other in conversation or in or uh in in live right as opposed to writing your blog or uh um and 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 just as important is really listening to other people's stories especially older people's stories which Maris has kind of touched on that too and um not being shy about developing your own stories and the kind of uh community relationships that that creates to have shared stories and to to uh, trade shared stories i think is something that especially now when so many people are you know isolated and lonely um and dependent more on um 
online sources if it's it's a way to to uh to again to make communities so that's i think that's what i would encourage